Thank you. Thank you. And we go forward to the next one. Uh, Marco Sicardi from Liverpool, integrating physiochemical descriptors with tissue and cellular data to make quantitative predictions through physiological based pharmacokinetic modeling. Okay, so uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today to try and describe how physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling can be applied uh, for uh, nanoparticles predicting uh, distribution and pharmacokinetics. So first of all, I would like to start from what uh, physiologically based pharmacokinetic is. It's nothing else than a flexible computational platform in which we can integrate a variety of different data to predict uh, distribution of small molecule or nanoparticle. Uh, so we can integrate uh, data describing physiological and anatomical features of patients, characteristics of the formulation APIs, as well as our understanding of absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination, uh, as well as animal data. So the core of our models is, is uh, a mechanistic description of biodistribution. Uh, uh, absorption, distribution, uh, degradation, metabolism, elimination, as well as the nanoparticle can penetrate in the target site. And then we use this mathematical framework uh, uh, to, to predict distribution, integrating experimental data that we can generate in our labs, and through a bottom-up approach, try and predict distribution in virtual patients as well as virtual animals. Uh, and not only uh, uh, average pharmacokinetics, but also theoretical viability over time in blood, plasma, as well as tissues and organs, to then ask what-if questions that can be very relevant in the uh, uh, developing process, uh, such as the optimization of the formulation, those findings, so which is the theoretical dose that we could use in humans, uh, potential effect of genetics, uh, PK in special populations, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is a, a diagrammatic representation of a, of a standard PVPK model where we have a mathematical description of flows, blo blood flows as well as lymphatic flow that are connecting different organ and tissues. And, and through differential equations, we are describing how nanoparticles, APIs, actually moving between different compartments. And then we can inform uh, uh, our models with uh, simulating different routes of administrations and different nanoformulations, uh, a specific role of, of different uh, population of cells, uh, um, activity of metabolic enzymes, as well as uh, simulate uh, uh, theoretical uh, anatomical barriers, the blood-brain barriers, the intestinal barrier, and so on and so forth. As I was saying, we can simulate just the PK, not on an average individual, but uh, take into account from a mathematical point of view, uh, demographic and anthropometric uh, uh, variability, we can then uh, build um, um, a set of mathematical equations to describe the, the theoretical variability that we can observe in populations. And therefore, we can then run simulations in virtual population of patients uh, with, with uh, different ages, different conditions, genders, uh, pregnancy, uh, and affect environmental factors. Okay, so how do we practically build our models? I try to summarize it through six steps. So first of all, we experimentally characterize and describe the ADMI processes, and we have seen the complexity related to, to these in the, previous, in the previous talks. And then we, we build mathematically our model uh, to then qualify the model against available in vivo data in preclinical species. And then if we can observe any discrepancies between our models and the observed data, we can then optimize our model through sensitivity analysis, for example. And then we start bridging our simulation in humans. And this is a very well-standardized kind of process for small molecule, where uh, nearly 100% of the input data that we actually feed into our models are coming from in vitro experimental data. So the application of PBPK in the nanomedicine area is just uh, is recent and, and started just a few years ago, and most of the input data that actually we are using or different groups are using for, for building the physiologically based model are actually coming from animal data, uh, complicating a bit the qualification of the model in step three. So in Liverpool, what we try to do is to switch this tendency and try to develop standardized in vitro assays that we can use to feed in our models. So I'm just going to summarize two, uh, quickly two examples due to the time limitations. Uh, 
uh, where we use BBPK to simulate a, a distribution of nanoparticles. So the first application that we developed was to try and, and, and rationalize a bit the develop, development of log-active strategies. So um, especially in the anti-HIV arena, at the moment there is a, a quite a lot of pressure to develop long-acting uh, long uh, administration through intramuscular injection. So that's what we're, we're trying to achieve with our PVPK model. So we develop a, quite a large uh, um, uh, range of experimental data where we describe the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination of, of our APIs, as well as the nanocrystal that we're using uh, for this type of application, integrate the data in our in silico simulations, qualify the, the model against PK, available PK data in humans and animals, and then characterize key pharmacokinetic variables. And then went back in our uh, simula in silico uh, simulations to, to, to predict what would be the theoretical PK resulting from alternative route of administration that had never been tested in humans. So then we can design virtual formulations that can be used to treat uh, patients uh, that, that in, in, in theoretical clinical trials. And this is the type of results that we can generate. So this is qu the qualification of the model against existing data for Rilpivirin and, and Cabotegravir in adults uh, uh, and, and the, with the uh, monthly injection of the nanocrystal of interest. And then we predicted theoretical PK in, in virtual children, which is a category of pa patients that is not normally treated with long acting uh, therapy, but can potentially represent a very useful, uh, a very useful tool for this, type of, for this type of patients. Second study that we recently published on, on the European Journal of Nanomedicine is relative to uh, SPIMS, uh, so obviously a nanoparticle that in circulations with specific characteristics. So we uh, quantify the um, uptake of spions in macrophages, uh, bo both murine and human uh, primary cells, and use the, 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 the data that we've generated through these experiments to derive the intrinsic in vitro clearance. And then we use these and other in vitro, in vitro data related to the stability of the spions to inform our model, our mathematical model of the, of the PK. Then we have quanti qualified our, our modeling against animal data, and as you can see here, our model can predict quite well uh, the accumulation of spions over a week in the animal model that we have used. So here is the simulated spions concentration against the observed spion uh, concentration in animals. And we have quite a good prediction for the key organs that we're actually interested in studies with some, uh, with, with some imprecisions around uh, a few different tissues. And then we use this qualified model against the preclinical species to then try to predict what will be the theoretical PK in humans. Uh, and this is just an example to show you how the model can actually apply to uh, simulate different scenarios of dosing as well as uh, application of different technologies. Obviously, because the models are so flexible that we can think if we have a, a, a well-established understanding of the ADMI and a, a, and a characterization of the uh, nanoformulation of interest, we can then apply this type of approach on, on a variety of different technologies, as we are currently doing, to simulate different routes of administration. For example, we have an NIH-funded uh, um, um, project for simulating the PK resulting from implants. Uh, to then in better inform drug delivery strategies, uh, uh, long-acting uh, uh, strategies, as well as uh, strategies to improve overall bioavailability, uh, but not only limited to these. Where PBPK models can actually be applied on across across uh, different stages of the research and development um, uh, process to understand better nanomedicine disposition and rationalize the selection of optimal candidates for specific applications, but also later on in, in clinical uh, stages. And for small molecules, this is very effective at the moment. Um, uh, so for example, uh, we, are, we are actually simulating a variety of different uh, clinical scenarios where they cannot be easily investigated uh, uh, clinically, and, and we try to rationalize the selection of strategies to BBPK modeling. And the regulatory opportunities related for, to, to PBPK are very relevant. So if we consider the example of small molecules, PBPK is a very standardized and well-established tool uh, used by pharmaceutical company and modeling company. 
and, and the FDA and EMA, EMA is actually supporting uh, uh, quite strongly the use of PBPK in the development of new molecule, uh, small molecules, uh, uh, mainly because it also helps a better mechanistic understanding of, of the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics. For the nanomedicine arena, actually, the, the use of PVPK is very in its very preliminary state, mainly because the, the, the main uh, limitation that we have at the moment that we don't have standardized experimental approaches to characterize absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. And the experimental models that we have been historically used for small molecules are not perfect to characterize ADMI of small molecules. So as nearly every single speaker before me, actually, the, the key to solve this is through uh, uh, interdisciplinary approaches where we can actually improve the, the quality of the experimental approaches that we have, as well as building better PVPK model for the future. Okay, so to summarize, my vision is actually is that PVPK can have a very broad application in the nanomedicine arena, uh, uh, spanning across basic, basic clinical research as well as regulatory studies, uh, and help us understanding better which are the mechanisms underpinning uh, uh, nanome nanomedicine distribution, um, uh, the role of specific population of cells in animals as well as in humans, rationalizing the, the, the design of clinical, tri uh, clinical trials as well as supporting a, a more rational uh, regulatory process. And I, I echo the comments that every single speaker before uh, me made actually to the only through effective collaborations between different institutes we can reach this objective. I leave you with some acknowledgments. I'm very happy to take your questions. Thank you. Questions? Yep. Uh, great talk. Uh, one of the uh, issues that has plagued us as far as modeling over the past decade is that transparency in the data uh, because the professors are very reluctant to show yes. you uh, adverse results, uh, things other than are published. So in the mm -hmm. end, it's almost a, a uh, uh, cut and paste from PubMed of what's uh, already a figure. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you're having any success with getting into the, the uh, nuances of <clears throat> things like surface chemistry and uh, how they're, they're seeing changes uh, with... Uh, and how PCC influences uh, ADMI talks. So to answer the, the first part of your question, I, I fully support that, and I think also that the, the fact that the, the overall structure of models is not always published, and the mathematics behind it sometimes is proprietary, complicates a lot of things. Uh, therefore, I'm, I'm very supportive of more open access, access and sharing of the modeling structure in the community. Um, regarding the second part of your question, that's uh, that's the exciting part of using PVPK. So trying to correlate nanop nanoparticle characteristics uh, through a modeling approach uh, to uh, biodistribution partners. It's challenging because, as we were saying before, nanoparticles can have multiple characteristics influencing ADMI. And therefore, identifying which nanoparticles we're going to use for that type of studies can be challenging. Yeah, time for one more question. So how much data do you actually need about the carrier? So say, for instance, it's stability. Yep. Does it leak? Does it not leak? I showed you the difference between a soft particle and a hard particle. Uh, same PK in the serum, but totally different um, you know, outcomes at tissue levels, mm -hmm. presumably because of the stability. So how, how does one account for this in so this modeling? That's, that's a very valid point. So I, I think what we're missing at the moment is the experimental approaches that we can best characterize those differences. So what we will, we will, we will need is um, an experimental approach where we can simulate the uh, anatomical barrier that, that the nanoparticle has to cross in order to, to, to reach the tissue of interest, for example. And that's missing at the moment. Um, so is, is the, the quality of the model is going to be influenced by the quality of the input data that you have available. And if the data are experimental, it's al always better than make assumptions related to the nanoparticle behavior, let's put it this way.